What is up, theology nerds? This is Trip. This this podcast now is one day into its tenth year of life, so we're like ten years plus one. And uh, today on the podcast is Sean McDowell. That's right, of evidence that demands a verdict. Fame, Sean McDowell, an apologist, a conservative Christian apologist, right here on the podcast, talking about the new edition of his book, which. Um, if you know me, if you listen regularly, then you understand that homebrewed Christianity is significantly more friendly with critical thinking and uh, philosophical theology and historical criticism and all that kind of stuff than Sean is. And one of the things I just want you to know up front is he was extremely nice. He was a real pleasant guy to talk to. I'm not sure I, I, I figured out how to ask the questions I wanted to ask. I really haven't spent enough time in the world that, uh, you know, reads his dad books and, and the new edition he's kind of helped put together and such um, to ask the questions that might have got at what those of you that grew up in that world uh, were looking for. But maybe he did. Um, I just know that uh, it, it was it was a treat to get to talk to him and that for them to even think about sending the book, you know, hey. I wasn't expecting it, uh, <laughs> but uh, this is the the last day, last tw- day to get the birthday price on Theology Beer Camp this summer. Theologybeercamp.com on August 16th, 17th, 18th in Asheville, North Carolina at Habitat Brewing Company. We're going to have three days of craft beer theological nerdiness, mm-hmm. and you should come. You should come. It's going to be a great community. It'll be a lot of tasty treats, and there'll be so many nuggets for your theological reflection and conversation. Then you're gonna you're gonna be saying to yourself, you know, thanks, 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 Trip. I had no idea that I could have as much fun as I did at a wild and crazy youth retreat, but do it with adults and at the same time use my brain. That's gonna happen at theology beer camp. Um, yeah. It is. It is. So, uh, before we jump into this podcast, I want to just remind you that we got that giveaway going on Mm -hmm. with West Star Institute. Lots of Jack Caputo, Catherine Keller, Marcus Borg, John Dominique Cross, and books all ready for your enjoyment. And if you are in the Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill area on August 18th, we have a live podcast. My friends from Cracker and Grape Juice. Crackers and Grape Juice. An above average podcast. (laughs) With significantly shorter intros. Um, They're going to be coming down from the D.C. area. And we're going to be having some fun with a whole bunch of my friends. But Stanley Hauerwasen, Will Willimon are going to be there. We're going to be talking about Resident Aliens. That influential book. And uh, if you noticed, the first 10 years of homebrewed Christianity was Hauerwas free. Now, there were some comments uh, about the Hauerwasian mafia. And, uh, you know, but in this next decade, I will talk to Hauerwas at least once for the podcast. And it's going to be exciting. Uh, Not only that, but my friends uh, at Emmaus Way in Durham, North Carolina, a uh, really sweet uh, kind of progressive postmodern church. They're going to be hosting it. And Molly and Tim, both from the church, are going to be in the house and having some fun. It, this is this is cool. This is, Tim, you, you, Tim Condor, who he was on the podcast like in the first 10 episodes, I'm sure. I'm sure he's been on. And, uh, and Molly is a graduate of Wake Forest University Divinity School. So she knows what's up, right? Go Deeks! I went to Wake Forest. University Divinity School. Mm -hmm. It was excellent. Anyway, this, this right here is a doozy of a podcast. I hope you enjoy it. And if you grew up, you know, reading McDowell's stuff, um, let me know what you think. And especially if you have like questions or lines of inquiry you'd really like to ask. Not like antagonize a guy. Because there's so many beginning assumptions that we don't share in common. But we both like value the body of Christ, the stories of Jesus, 
the truth we've encountered there. And uh, I tried to keep that front and center while talking, but also get out uh, of him, you know, where his confidence lies in certain areas. And we'll see if I did a good job. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But I'm just saying, if you've listened and you and that and you've spent some time in that part of the world, if you have other types of questions and such, you'd ask them. Let me know. And I'll see if I can be like. Don't you want to hang out with me on the internet again? We'll see. We'll see. But until then, go to theologybeercamp.com. Because the summer is going to be awesome. Peace. Hello, everybody. This is Trip, And today we are with Sean McDowell. And uh, he and I uh, have something in common, being like preacher's kids. So uh, on top of getting brought in to your father's ministry, something I've experienced uh, greatly, you have a perk of not having the exact same first name. So uh, I think the first place to begin is what is it like uh, being a part of uh, and a son of someone people know and then being brought into this new addition and new work on something like evidence that demands a verdict? Yeah, that's a big question. I, you know, as far as being the, the son of Josh McDowell growing up, I just didn't know any different. I didn't look at my dad first as this kind of author or speaker. He was just my dad. And I always respected him because he lived out what, what he preached. And, you know, I appreciated that. We've always had a good relationship. We've done probably half a dozen books together. And I would say evidence demands a verdict, along with more than the carpenter, definitely two of the most special ones. Because I think when it's all said and done, his influence really or legacy really will be a lot of the work of this book. I mean, I can't go anywhere without someone telling me either that evidence that demands a verdict to help them hold on to their faith during a season of doubting or it's one tool God used to draw them to Christ. So working on this together about the last three years is kind of been surreal it's been powerful and it's been pretty rewarding and fun too so when when you go to work on a a a new edition of a book that uh has sold so much impacted so many people consistently comes up in in conversations uh what were the questions or issues or uh new evidence or or things that that drove to re-engaging a text like that yeah, that's a great question. The first thing is I didn't want to screw it up. <laughs> I was like, man, I'm feeling the weight of getting this thing right because of just how many people over four decades rely upon this text as just a good resource of evidence for the Christian faith. So I felt the weight of it. It wasn't like I was afraid of really screwing up. It was just like, I got to get this thing right and let's put in the work to make sure it's excellent. So that was that was a kind of place to start. And then Really, on a book like this, we worked with three dozen graduate students, mostly from Biola, a student from Liberty. We had a dozen of the leading scholars in the world on the Bible, on the resurrection, on archaeology. So really, the work was just setting people free to edit, to research, to write. Managing this team was a massive, massive task. And we just went through in every chapter of the book multiple editors, multiple researches, just to make sure we could say to people the clear conscious, hey, here's one text that has the best evidence for the resurrection, the greatest manuscript account for the New Testament, uh, the best evidence for the deity of Christ. So it was a ton of work. But now that it's done, I'm glad I'm relieved for one, but second, feel really good about what what we've come up with. Mm -hmm. So when when you're growing up uh, and and your your father has this this vocation and calling and things uh, like what was the point in your life where you had the most like critical questions or doubts or, or thoughts? Cause I know uh, a lot of people uh, that are in, that are regular listeners to the podcast. I mentioned that we were going to talk and they all had very different like stories and questions and stuff that pop up. And one of them that came up pretty consistently, like it was like, what was, what was Sean's biggest moment of doubt or most difficult period? Because I think a, people experience the text as, you know, this obviously like a lot of scholars putting together strongest arguments and, and, and but underneath it, like what was the life of faith, the most difficult uh, questions that you've had? Yeah, I'm glad you asked this question because when I was growing up, maybe junior high and high school, I thought somebody 
wasn't a Christian because they just hadn't read uh, one of my dad's books. I mean, I thought, how hard is it? Here's the evidence. Just believe. And then I got to university. I think I was about 19 years old. And this is like mid 90s when a lot of the Internet was really hitting on a popular level. And the secular web actually began responding chapter by chapter to evidence that demands a verdict. Oh, wow. And I, yeah, I didn't know that until recently. But at that time in the 90s, I came across this and I'm reading historians and philosophers and, you know, archaeologists critiquing chapter by chapter. And I thought, gosh, my I know my dad means well, but what if he's wrong about this? These are really smart critiques. Now I look back and I don't think their arguments were that good, to be honest. But at the time, it was really unsettling to me. And I actually went to my dad and I just said, hey, dad, I got to be honest with you. I want to know it's true, but I'm not sure I'm really convinced this is true. Not knowing what he was going to say, given that he's spent his life defending and proclaiming Christianity. And he just looked at me and goes, son, I think that's great. And I remember thinking, did you hear what I just said? I said, I'm not sure that I buy this. And he goes, look, you, go, you can't live your life on my convictions. You have to know and what you think is really true mm-hmm. and live it out. And he said, look, I'm actually confident if you seek truth, you'll be led to Jesus because Jesus is the truth. Then he said, don't forsake some of the things we've taught you if you learned growing up just to rebel, only walk away from anything in life if you're convinced that it's not true. And then he just said something like, and you know, your mom and I will love you no matter what. And it was really kind of a moment. I'm not sure I ever stopped believing, Mm -hmm. but I, for the first time, really started to feel the weight of like, gosh, what if I don't believe this? Have I really considered other alternatives fairly and justly? Have I read other religious texts? What if I was born in a different faith? Mm -hmm. And that was kind of a season that I went through. And ironically, I didn't turn to the book Evidence that Demands a Verdict. I actually turned to some other scholars who said a lot of the same things my father had said, but sometimes you just need somebody else to say it. So that was probably a big questioning period for me where I would say I really felt like I solidified my own faith. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people get to that point where they go, you know, am I in this faith? Do I believe these things just because I'm a parent of or I'm a kid of these parents and this part in history that went to this community of faith and that kind of thing. And, and one of the things that has always uh, struck me is the, it it seems to me there's a difference um, from kind of being convinced that something, you know, is, is plausible or factual or the evidence could, you know, persuade someone this and that kind of, I don't know, subjective existential, uh, I don't know, in the gut region encounter with God and Christ. Like, how do you, how do you kind of understand the difference between like, uh, an intellectual assent or some, or, or like, I believe this makes sense. And, uh, like kind of like you are the Christ son of the living God, uh, kind of response. So I I guess I'd make a couple of distinctions. Uh, William Lane Craig, one of the great philosophers and apologists of our day, says there's a difference between knowing that Christianity is true and showing that it's true. So I believe we can know that Christianity is true through a personal experience of the Holy Spirit, God in our life, revealing himself to me. I mean, it says in Romans that you cry out, you know, Abba, Father. So I don't believe that somebody has to have all the evidence to know that Christianity is true. After all, there's been people throughout the history of the world who don't have access to this. So I'm not a Mormon. I disagree with with Mormonism on many levels. But the idea that God can speak to us directly into our hearts and reveal a knowledge of the truth, I think is actually true. Now, how? so what's the value of the evidence? Well, two things come in. Number one it builds up a confidence that that experience is really veridical and true because there's a lot of people who've had experiences. And then when the facts don't line up with it, it begins to undermine our confidence that this is really true. And that's the difference between Christianity and Mormonism is Mormons say they have an experience and I don't doubt that they've had some kind of experience, but the facts are not there to back it up. So they should question Mm -hmm. the experience they think that they've had. Second, the evidence also gives us not only a confidence that this is true, but the ability to turn around and articulate to other people why we believe this. And when we don't have that, when all we have is this experience, 
I found that we're not able to our, have really thoughtful conversations with people. So one thing that I do trip is I go to churches and schools and conferences and I put on these glasses and they know I'm a Christian, but I role play an atheist and I'll take questions from the audience and 15, 20 minutes in, I've shot them, shot down the questions and people get defensive and angry and sometimes hostile. I take the glasses off and I say, before I answer the questions, how'd you treat me? And there's a sense where people look at me like, oh my goodness, I was kind of a jerk to you. And I'll say, why did people get so defensive? And the answer is because they don't know what they believe and why. If we have a faith just grounded in experience, but we haven't taken the time to think through, why do I believe the Bible is true? How do I explain this to somebody? Why do I believe Jesus rose from the grave historically? How do I really know X, Y, and Z? Then when we're challenged, it's natural just to be hostile and not have a good response. But when we not only know through our experience, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we know because we've done a research, then chances are we're in such a better position to articulate our beliefs and have thoughtful conversations with people who don't believe. Mm-hmm. So, so what do you think the the main reasons are that uh, everybody doesn't end up uh, finding Christianity as like obviously true or compelling? Well, I think there's a ton of reasons why. I mean, obviously, you have the Spirit working in people's hearts in ways we can't see and we don't know. So, if you just speak on a human level, I actually would say there's there's um, emotional reasons. Some people have hurts. There's relational reasons where there's relational brokenness that affects the way people think about it. There's moral issues. I mean, I've had people tell me straight up, a guy not too long ago, he goes, look, I think probably what you're saying about Christianity being true is true, but I've got 10 girls I'm texting. So why should I give up that for some belief? I mean, he just owned that there's a moral reason. I think it can be volitional. It can be the will. I mean, think of John Bon Jovi, you know, it's my life. Hey, I get to live it how I want to. So when it's all said and done, I don't think most people's objections are purely intellectual. I think the intellect has a piece to do with it. But really, all apologetics does in books like Evidence is clearing away objections so people can see Christ for who he is. So I wonder like how uh, – maybe you could say more about that because – like when you hear just the phrase like evidence that demands a verdict, that seems like uh, it's a a apologetics tone that's like confrontational or, or like we're go- it assumes you're like in a I don't know a debate where you, know, you have like an atheist here and a theist here and they're going to like let's wrestle with the facts and see where it goes and 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 like I my experience of faith e- through throughout most of my life has been where. That battle line between kind of, you know, of thinking things through feels like it runs right through me, that I'm like a believer and a skeptic at the same time, and that the typical confrontation or, or, or way of, of of doing apologetics seems to, like, force me as a Christian, as a minister and things to um, not recognize the, the doubts and things I carry with me, and I found that – a lot of times by being able to voice them and share them, a lot of the congregants and people uh, that I'm ministering to go, yeah, I'm here and I, and I have faith that I believe. And the, and the faith isn't opposed to, to the doubts and things I carry. That's just part of being human in our, in our time culture situation. So the title actually was a part of the first book in 1972. Mm-hmm. And obviously culture was very, very different on many levels in 1972. And then it was updated the eighties and nineties. We had a lot of conversations about whether we should keep the title or not. And ultimately just because it's so well known, yeah. it's a trusted brand. I thought we cannot change the title of this. We'll lose stuff. So I understand that that's how on the surface the title can come across. We actually were very, very careful in the tone in the book to say, this is not adversarial. This is not about having arguments. In fact, I added an extended introduction where I walk through why apologists often have a bad name because we do apologetics in a cold manner. We don't tell stories. We don't recognize that these are human beings who have doubts. We just don't do it. Sometimes apologists are not healthy people and they just want to argue. Mm -hmm. So actually, talk about that in the introduction and go out of our way to really say, 
we don't want to overstate the evidence. We want to let the evidence speak for itself. So in one sense, the title is just saying, look, the evidence demands a verdict. You've got to choose. You might choose in favor of it. You might choose against it. But even Jesus, look, people either they they called him a drunk, they called him demon possessed, or they fell down and they worshiped him. I mean, the person of Jesus demands a verdict one way or the other. You can't stand on the sidelines. Now, with that said, what you said about doubt, I, I actually agree a hundred percent with that. This book is not saying we can answer all of your questions and don't have doubts. I mean, that's that's crazy. I actually have consistent doubts in my life. And sometimes I have a friend who's a pastor who just doesn't seem to have any doubts. He has the gift of faith. And I've often thought, man, I wish my faith was just simpler like his. But I'll tell you this, trip. if I had the gift of faith in that way, I would not have spent three years researching and writing an 800-page book trying to find answers to help people out because it's a lot of my own doubts that drive me to this. Mm -hmm. So I'm with you. And a lot of times in conversations, I'll say to people, I'll say, you know what? That's a great question. And to be honest, sometimes I wrestle with that myself. I don't have a perfect answer for you, but here's how I make sense of this. Maybe it'll be helpful to you. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I I think there's, uh, it's a big, the, I don't know. I don't know how, how it gets divided up, but um, that kind of evidentialist approach to, to apologetics, I think a lot of times, uh, until you are a person of faith, is experienced real differently than if you are already a, a person of faith and have questions, right? Like if they read the book and they have doubts about something but would see you at already as an ally, um, it like the evidentialist approach is different than when you're not. And I've <clears> – <throat> like – when I think through, I've done confirmation, uh, taught confirmation for a couple hundred teenagers, and the, I've never had the experience where they ask, like, well, can you prove the Bible is the word of God or that the resurrection was physical and stuff? The compelling parts of faith usually have come out of, like, you know, reading the story, the gospel stories and seeing a beautiful picture of truth, a way of living and engaging the world and encountering God, that uh, it, it's been more aesthetic. I mean, have you seen a shift in culture, generations, or time that that uh, you kind of talked about how the, the you thought about changing the title, but it, that people now, their encounter, what's compelling about the gospel is more beauty than uh, at first, than truth at first? I do think there's some cultural shifts from when evidence came out in the seventies and we could come back to those. I do think though, human nature doesn't change. We're called love God, with our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. And I think CS Lewis was so powerful and compelling because he used reason. He used evidence, but he also used story and he also used fiction. And he showed not only that Christianity is true, but that Christianity is beautiful. And I think that's what's been powerful about Jesus is you look at the life of Jesus, read John chapter five. I mean, he gave prophecy, pointed to scripture. He gave evidences, but it was in the context of the beauty of the person that he was and is. And I think the same is true with Paul. So people are different. Some people are drawn more cognitively. Some people are drawn more relationally. Some people are drawn more experientially. And that's why Jesus adapted his message to the different people that he ministered to. And I think today one mistake is when we just present apologetics in a rational, cold manner and don't show that it fulfills the deepest needs of the human heart for relationship, for beauty, for these kinds of other aesthetic things, then that's a fault. So we're not doing everything in the book, Evidence It Demands a Verdict, that's for sure. And I'm with you on the role of beauty. Evidence is actually first written for believers. Right. Primarily. We've had a ton of skeptics read it and a ton of agnostics, and their experience is going to be different than someone who's already a believer. And of course, it depends on their attitude. Some people pick it up just to disprove it and show that it's false. Other people pick it up with a with an open mind to it. So really, like any book, your experience is just going to be based on your experience, your philosophy, and the attitude that, that you bring to it. So when when Jesus and the disciples or when Jesus kind of asks the disciples, who do they say I am? And, you know, they give off all these different answers. And who do you say I am? And Peter says, 
you're the Christ son, the living God. And then Jesus says like my father in heaven revealed that to you. Like, like I wonder, I will, I wonder how much, how many times in my, I mean, I might be overthinking it, but that uh, a lot of times when we're doing kind of apologetics in this way, it's kind of like we're looking at people going, um, no, if you just are, if you just look at the evidence, the, the, it's obvious Jesus is Lord and the disciples in that text are going, you know, you can live with the actual Jesus, like be his, you know, his disciple and see him preach and all this stuff and have all these different, uh, I don't know, viable conclusions historically, but having been in, but when the father reveals to you, this is the son, um, the, the, it seemed different. And I wonder if there's a, uh, there's something to be gained by going, yeah, there's there, you know, there are un, a completely implausible historical reconstructions of Jesus. And then there's these that are, they're more faithful. We argue for this one, but part of that is already connected to an experience of God, uh, mediated by Jesus or, or something like that. Um, yeah, it could be. I, I get, I'm hesitant to just take the example of Peter who was clearly an apostle saw Jesus in the flesh and normalize it for all of our experiences. Clearly that was a unique time where he came down, called his disciples, was there in the flesh doing certain things and really being the Messiah, but surprising the people how he was the Messiah. There were very strong expectations amongst many people. And Jesus is like, look, yes, I'm the Messiah, but you missed part of it from the old Testament. If you look more closely, you'll see that it is me. So, I, I, I'm hesitant to normalize that. I think, you know, God uses just a variety of experiences for people. I have a friend, Jay Warner Wallace, a cold case detective, where it was very cognitive for him. In fact, he was brought to Saddleback Church by his wife, and we quote him a bunch in the book, 35 years old, never lost a case. And he hears the gospel and goes, you know what, I'm just going to examine Mark through the lens of forensic science. And he ends up concluding that it's reliable testimony before he even understood what the message meant. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that was God working through his heart, opening up his eyes. I totally believe the spirit was present, but his experience was not, here's the experience first. And then I understand it. It was, okay, it's true. Now help me to understand it. So I think people just have a variety of experiences and and we're not saying in evidence that you can just argue somebody into the kingdom. Of course you can't. Mm-hmm. You can't love somebody into the kingdom. We're just called to be faithful. We're called to love people. We're called to speak truth and to believe boldly that God can use our relationships. God can use our conversations as one tool he uses to draw people to the kingdom. And seeing that happen, frankly, I know you know this is one of the most rewarding things that we can do. So do you – when – when you think of uh, like the the a part of the church that has that you and your father's work have had an ongoing relationship, like how how do you see the relationship with the the like other parts of the church, like uh, you know more mainline Protestants and there are more evangelicals who would see wouldn't you know wouldn't sit around and and argue for. Scripture to like have the type of authority or or things you understand it to be, or the church has uh you you have uh theological articulations of the resurrection that you know don't have this kind of historical physical thing as essential to it or or that type of stuff how how does the relationship with other parts of the church uh changed and uh over time? Uh, yeah, so that's a tough question because it's a broad question. Other parts of the church, one thing we've heard from, it, it's pretty remarkable how much some of my father's work because he doesn't deal with secondary issues. Talks about deity, Christ, Bible being true, reliability of the scriptures. I mean, across Catholic, Orthodox, a variety of Protestant traditions, people value that and want to show that it's true. So. I mean, we got a number of Catholics who endorse the book. I've heard from some Orthodox that it kind of transcends a lot of denominational differences. Now, when you're talking with mainline, I guess it's going to depend on which mainline you're you're talking to. But I would argue that if you say Jesus did not rise physically from the grave, 
you're not preaching the gospel. So I'd love to talk with these people and I'd love to have conversations with them. I hope they would read the book, but I would bring it back to the basics and say, okay, what do the scriptures teach? Why is the resurrection even necessary? The bodily resurrection. And I think if somebody denied some of the essentials, I would say that person is not believing the faith that Jesus taught, Paul taught, and that has been passed down through generations. So do you think that um, the particular uh, – that some of the emphases that uh, the evidence focuses on are questions that really got centralized kind of after the Enlightenment where uh, the the larger public is asking questions that used to just happen in the academy? Um, and you have a, a larger awareness of like religious pluralism. So you have like neighbors in other faiths on your street who are like n- better neighbors than you are. Um, awareness of historical criticism and this type of thing. Um, do you think the the impact these kind of very enlightenment centered questions uh, has ultimately been positive? For for the church, or are they things we kind of need to deal with to then turn our focus back to, I don't know, like like doing the actual teachings of Jesus and engaging our community and things? Well, I, d- I think the big questions we're asking in the book are the same questions you see wrestled in the Gospels. I mean, the resurrection is central to the message of who Jesus is. Romans 1.4, 1 Corinthians 15, all of the Gospels climax in the resurrection, confirming his claim to be Christ. So the big themes that we walk through in the book are the themes that we would argue are in scripture. Now, with that said, there are some particular issues that maybe the enlightenment and modern scholarship has made us focus on that were not areas of debate in the early church, like such as, say, the historical Adam, or even the idea that Jesus didn't exist. I mean, even Bart Ehrman, the great skeptic today said people didn't doubt the existence of Jesus until like the 18th century. So clearly Paul wasn't concerned with proving that Jesus existed. Everyone accepted it, but now that's a significant movement. And because of the internet and because of where some strains of scholarship have gone, we have to respond to this. So I don't see it as just let's get this out of the way and just do what Jesus did. I think good Christian scholarship, articulating, defending, proclaiming the Christian message is one important way of being faithful to the gospel. So I look at scholars who spend their lives looking at these issues. I think that's one way just as being as faithful as say a pastor or somebody who reaches out to the poor. So I don't, I don't break it up in that kind of fashion, but I do think when it's all said and done, why do we do this scholarship? Well, to me, it is to draw people back to Jesus. Mm -hmm. So Christians will say, okay, gosh, this isn't just a fairy tale. This isn't just something I feel. This is really true, and I have the confidence. And am I going to live this out in practicing his teachings and being able to have conversations with Mm non-believers? So yes, all of apologetics is not just about sitting around, let's argue, let's prove I'm right, you're wrong. I mean, who cares about that when it's all said and done? The question is, do we know who Jesus is? Does this shape our confidence, and are we going to live differently in light of it? And and I wonder if like the biggest uh, hindrance or the the common pushbacks I've I've had from uh, f- friends that have either left the faith or or, or or in a different faith or or or, or agnostic atheists, um, the biggest hindrance to uh, the viability of Christianity is the way we end up treating our neighbors um, are like, like the, the all, how we kind of treat gay lesbian uh, community are like that Christians are the least likely to be working uh, like to, you think of them as like the biggest uh, Trump supporters and, uh, and one and not really wanting to engage in like reflection around like climate change or something like that, that has an impact on our grandkids and stuff. So it's hard. I, like to me, I think if we were the community that cared for uh, those that are outcast the most um, and decide to take care of the planet and the poor the most, then a lot of our rational discussion becomes more believable. But so often we're, we uh, we we make the news as being the uh, the the more judgmental ones and stuff. I I think there's a lot of truth and wisdom in what you said, Trip, which is why. 
in the intro, before we get to the evidence, mm-hmm. we say Look, there's a lot of objections people have that they won't even consider the evidence. Right. Listen to these. It said Christianity cannot be true because the church has committed injustices. That's huge in people's minds. The next one, the hypocrisy of Christians undermines the reasonability of the Christian faith. The next one, the intolerance of Christians. And we go on and on for exactly the reasons that you mentioned. That the fact that we don't live this out, that we're not showing compassion, that we're not loving people, that we have hypocrisy in our own lives, totally undermines the power, not only of the evidences, but the gospel itself. So I think it used to be people would look in and say, you're not giving good reasons, it's false. Now a lot of people are saying, gosh, you're not living it out. It's false. Mm -hmm. So yes, we must make a good presentation of the gospel. In fact, at the very beginning, one thing we say is we say the most powerful defense of the Christian faith is not in the evidences. It's a clear presentation of the gospel backed up by someone filled with the Holy Spirit living out the way Christ wants us to live. That's the most powerful defense. So so how would you – like what kind of advice do you give to – to Christians and churches and church leaders really who are having these co- like discussions uh, around um, say like uh, how to treat uh, gay members of the congregation or something like that and how we relate to the community when it's a time uh, when um, it, it's just, it seems to me that like the church just in that when we have being a minister in LA for a long time has caused so much harm that, it it's hard to uh, uh, I don't know broach the, broach the topic and subject in a way that allows space for any healing, let alone transformation. Well, I'd say a couple things. First off, churches have to have the confidence to have these conversations. Not having them is actually worse, and it sends the message that the church is not a safe place, and that you're going to have to get your real questions answered elsewhere. So shame on churches who don't even bring these topics up. It's Andy Stanley who said it should be the church where kids can wrestle with the topic you mentioned of homosexuality and other sexual issues more than anywhere else. Second, we also have to take people back to what the scripture teaches on these subjects. It's when we don't really know, okay, what does the Bible say about marriage? What is it? Does it say anything about abortion? Does it speak into pornography and relationships and all these issues we can bring in? It's when we don't know and haven't taken the time to look scripturally that, number one, people get confused, and number two, we're threatened by other people's positions. And then third, just make sure, I think, if the pastor sets the tone from the top down of here's what we believe as a church, but we love people who are different, they're invited into the conversation and models this to the church, I don't think we have anything to be afraid of. I really don't. I think we have the truth on our side. We have the most compassionate person who's ever lived, and we have a history of doing this well. Now, a lot of people haven't done it well in the church, but I think ignoring this and doing it poorly does far more harm than having the courage to just kind of buck up and have these conversations. And I think most people want to have these conversations. I really do. So when it comes to to having conversations around like the scriptures and, and, and marriage and family and issues and stuff, how do you... That's when you go back and look at the history and, and things differentiate what is kind of part of the historical setting or time or where culture and, and things were at one point to today. Cause like, you know, I'm, there's probably more polygamous members of, uh, more polygamous patriarchs than, uh, uh monogamous ones with, uh, and, and, uh, you have like all sorts of, uh, transformations like women start in being dealt with more as property rights and gets transitioned to then uh it, you know Jesus being a single guy rolling around um uh, with his with his disciples and 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 Paul who may or may not have been married having lots of thoughts on marriage and stuff in the context there being more r- like Roman culture and such like w- w- it unlike. All the all the gospels think God raised Jesus from the dead, so that seems like pretty straightforward. Now we can talk about it, but the 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 intensity for which people have feelings around uh, sexuality or same sex marriage, when the the I don't know plethora of of ways it's dealt with and understood in Scripture it doesn't seem uh, it doesn't seem the same. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. First off, you said Jesus was single. Clearly, you haven't read the Da Vinci Code. Trip. Oh, I have. I, I, yeah, I, I, I forgot that. It, uh... I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> it is. It so, is a good. It is a good. Uh, it's a good way to uh, uh, stir up some uh, attention. Is uh... that is for sure? Yeah, no question about that. Well, I think ultimately we need to go back to Scripture. That's really our guide, and make a few distinctions: what is essential, what's non-essential. And second, what does the Bible teach and what does the Bible uh, portray of the way the early teachers really were and what does the Bible endorse? So, yeah, a lot of the patriarchs are polygamists, but the Bible doesn't endorse this. In fact, if you read the life of Jacob and David, it's almost as if God says, fine, don't follow the teaching back in Genesis about one man and one woman for life. I'm going to let you do this. I'm going to use you anyways for good, but you get to deal with the consequences and the pain and the hurt in your own life. And the life of Jacob and David, it's tragic because they don't live out what scripture teaches. So we just have to remember everything the Bible records, it doesn't necessarily endorse. You wonder, if, also, you wonder if God came over to Adam and was like, well, you have some more ribs. If you want a few more <laughs> wives and just take a nap real quick. <laughs> That's the alternate version. Yeah, I have, no, I have no idea how that would have gone down. What's in Dan Brown's, Dan Brown's next book? It's called The Second Rib. The Really? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I just lost my train of thought. Oh, here, so, so you're right. You go back early in the church, and you don't see the creeds dealing with, like, the nature of marriage. And that's because a lot of doctrine of the church has been developed carefully in light of pushback by heresies, we see this with the Trinity. People were teaching views about Jesus and early church said, wait a minute, we've got to clarify precisely exactly what the scriptures teach. So issues of sexuality were not pressing inside the church early on in the way that they are today. So that doesn't mean they're not central. Doesn't mean it's not important. We've got to go back to the scriptures themselves. What does the Old Testament teach? What does Jesus teach? What does Paul teach? And make sure we use that as our standard. And so, so then, like, what would you like? Like, what do you end up? What do you end up thinking is the is the standard? Like, so, and I feel like the the value of women is something that transitions throughout Scripture quite a bit. And uh, and you know when you when you start to see women as like having the full image of God. Um, that was given to them and, uh, and, and, you know, able, like, uh, able to, to, you know, preach and prophesy and stuff in the new Testament and that kind of thing. Then you, and then you look back and see women in kind of property rights discussions. It, it seems like that's like one place where there's like evidence of, I don't know, moral development or progress or something. Well, I think William Webb is right. He wrote a provocatively titled book, Slaves, Women, and Homosexuals. And he argues that when it goes to slavery and women, there's a trajectory in the Bible in which the Bible deals with this patriarchal broken culture and is slowly moving it positively towards an ethic, which is complete liberation of slavery and complete equality of women. Mm -hmm. So there's this trajectory in the Bible where God is just working through generation, generation, moving towards the ideal, but practically working with a broken people where they happen to be. Now, I don't think the Bible teaches women are not equal. I think the Bible is, starting with Genesis, the most pro-woman religious text of any significance ever written. I mean, go to Genesis, my goodness. Most ancient cosmogenies don't even mention the creation of women. The Bible not only mentions it, but number one, a woman's taken from the side of a man, not his feet, not his head. And a helper doesn't mean somebody to be his assistant. It means really an equivalent who will be one with man. And even look at the story. I mean, he makes man on, you know, on day six and is like, well, I'm not quite done. The story climaxes with the creation of women. Genesis account shows women have the highest regard. Then you go to the New Testament. I ask my skeptical friends this sometimes. I say, look, think of all the different uh, influential religious leaders. Who would you trust your daughter with for a day? Would you trust her with Joseph Smith? To be honest with you, I wouldn't, given the way he treated women. 
Would you trust her with Mohammed? No. Would you trust her with Charles Taze Russell, the founder of uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, who was at least accused of sexual abuse? No. Would you trust her with Jesus? Absolutely. He had every opportunity to take advantage of women. And yet he showed nothing but dignity and love and care and respect for them. Now, I concede there's difficult passages we have to go into in Paul. I totally, I'm not saying that's not there. But in the big picture of things, I think the Bible holds up women with the greatest esteem and value and has been one of the reasons that Christians have been on the side of the right liberation of women. But Jesus was a bit too much of a hippie to have a concealed weapons carry permit, and I'd prefer my daughter. uh, (laughs) I'm with you on that. (laughs) (laughs) uh, uh, So when – when you when you were going back into this new edition and working with all the scholars and stuff like, what was the uh, uh, the the biggest pieces of, of of information or insights that you didn't anticipate? Like, what what what's what are you most excited about uh, in and uh, and having like put together or clarified in the uh, in kind of reworking the whole thing? Yeah, so I didn't know what needed to be included, not included, without getting some help from other scholars. So the Old Testament section, which was in the last update, 1999, in this version is almost entirely new. The questions people are asking about the Old Testament in the last two decades has been transformed. It used to be what's called the documentary hypothesis that that the JEDP. Yeah, JEPD, that the writings of Moses were multiple authors, etc. That's like a footnote in a sense. That's one chapter now. That used to be the entire section. Now we walk through historical Adam, the Exodus, the patriarchs, the monarchy, the key events and people in the Old Testament. And seeing some of the evidence that's been unearthed in the past few years is pretty remarkable. There's obviously a lot missing. You're dealing with events two, three, four thousand years ago. But seeing even some of the evidence for the Old Testament accounts was pretty fascinating. On the New Testament side, one of the chapters that took the most work was updating the manuscript account for uh, the New Testament itself. Mm -hmm. So comparing, we went back and did the research of how many copies of, say, Thucydides and Plato's writings and Aristotle and the Odyssey and got an updated account on the manuscripts of the New Testament. And it's remarkable. Just in the past two decades, I asked my dad, I said, when you wrote, well, when you wrote evidence in 72 versus now, how would you compare the evidence? And he said, there is a tsunami of evidence in comparison to when I first started on this journey four decades ago. Mm -hmm. So like on, um, like when you're doing something like that and in changing a lot, I could imagine people going, well, your conclusions didn't change, but you rewrote a whole section and come up with you know new, uh, new evidence to to demand the same verdict and stuff. How, like how I could imagine a real cynical response that um, you know, like with each update or, or version of it, it's like oh let's go find new stuff that may or may not be the same we used before to say the same thing. And uh, in the way you describe it is like since your dad first published it, it's kind of been a an ever ongoing research project that, um, you know, changes with questions that come up and also new evidence and things. So how, how do you deal with the kind of cynical, uh, way people could see a whole stack of new evidence and. Yeah. Great question. Let me answer this one. Then I apologize. I got to run my kids to school. Oh, no, no, no problem. I'm going to have to sneak out after this. Remember when my dad first wrote evidence, he wasn't setting out to prove Christianity was true. He was setting out to prove that it was false. So he actually changed his mind in light of the evidence that he came across. So first writing it was trying to show it's false, become a convinced it's true. Then now once he believed it, and I came to the conclusion that I believe it, yes, we're looking out there going, what is the most compelling and powerful evidence for Christianity? But that doesn't mean it's a blind search that says, well, we're going to ignore all the tough things, and we're just going to pick and choose the positive things. That's not how I think about stuff. I mean, I read a ton of Christian apologetics, historical, archaeological texts, but I am interacting, as you can see throughout the book, with the skeptics. And I'm a consummate skeptic, Trip. I'm always asking myself, is this really true? Is this actually a good point? Am I fairly stating the evidence? And I'm sure I fall short at times, 
But a constant part of the way is not just let's make this polemical book and just try to persuade everybody that we're true. Let's lay out there what we think is the most compelling evidence because we've sifted through it because we think it makes sense because there are a lot of smart people who buy this. So there is a voice in the back of my mind all the time that says present it fairly. Don't overstate it. Let the evidence speak for itself. Make sure you engage the skeptic. So there's some evergreen material that was in the original evidence that we've carried through. But there's just a lot of material that we've added. And frankly, there's some stuff that I took out. There's some things in the original I pushed back. I'm like, Dad, I know where you're going with this, but I'm not sure I really buy this. And we had a lot of good give and take in that regard and pulled stuff out that I didn't think was accurate or as fair. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, thank you so much for, for talking, sharing, and, um, and and coming on. And I hope that uh, you know, in, in 20 years or 15 years when the next edition comes out <laughs> – <laughs> that we'll uh, we'll get to uh, chat again. Hey, Trip. Thanks. Really good questions. I appreciate just the pushback and thoughtfulness with which you bring. This is really fun. Mm-hmm.